Good evening and welcome. We welcome you here to our midweek service, Grace Life Church in Jimison, Alabama. Glad you're tuning in or if you're watching at uh, another time, we're glad that you're part of our service here. And uh, for sake of a title tonight, I don't know if it's a good title, but we'll just call it, Do You, Do you Know Where You're Headed? And uh, <clears throat> you may think, well, everybody knows where they're headed. Well, not so much, not always. Sometimes there's just a lot of motion and uh, not a whole lot of, uh, not a whole lot of you know, positive movement. It's kind of like being on a rocky horse. There's a, there's a lot of activity, but not a whole lot of productivity. And so and, uh, we're going to use Philippians chapter 3 as just as a, as a text for this. And um, Paul said, he said in verse 12, he says, Not as though I've already attained, either were made perfect, but I follow after that, if I may apprehend that which I have apprehended that which I have also been apprehended of in Christ Jesus. He said, Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended, but this one thing Paul said that I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I'm reaching forth into those things which are before. I press, verse 14, he said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul said, he, Paul said I'm still moving forward in this thing. I haven't attained in all things. And I'm moving forward. He said, I haven't reached the prize. But he said, I have my eye on the prize. I have my eye on the mark. So it's just like being on the interstate a lot of times. If you're looking for a certain exit, maybe you're counting the, how many miles you away, you know, to get off at a, your destination or a place to eat or a hotel, whatever. You can, you know, you can kind of do the math. You know, we're going to mile marker so-and-so, and every mile, I guess it's that way where it has a mile marker, and then you do the math to know where you are. So... We're talking kind of part about uh, the, the dream and the vision and the way to get there and some of the components. If you, uh, Sunday morning we were talking about confidence and we'll probably visit that again. But these are some of the other kind of components that you're gonna that you're gonna need along the way with your confidence toward your destination, because God's given every one of us uh, a vision. He's given us one of us a plan for our life, and it's a good plan. He said it's a good plan. Jeremiah said it's an it's an absolutely a good plan above that which you would even uh, hope or, or expect in Ephesians chapter 3. But we have, to have some de- we have to have some destination markers to know where we are and to, on our way to where we're headed. So that's what Paul said. He said, he said uh, I've learned how the, I have to, to get to where I'm going. He said, I've had to learn how to forget some things. Anybody ever had to forget some things? And I didn't, notice I didn't say people. I just said some things. So... So sometimes we've had some things in our life happen. Maybe there's setbacks, whatever's happened. But we've had to, to get where we're going to go. We have to stay focused, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about a little bit more tonight than anything is, if we can get that far, is about being focused. Yeah. And uh, you think, well, everybody knows about focus. Well, we, yeah, we know about it. I know about a lot of stuff, but I'm, that I'm not doing. How about you? And so we're going to just uh, look at it a little bit more, uh, in uh, in detail tonight. Uh, just kind of give you some things um, after, I guess here's one way you're saying, uh, uh, the dream or the vision or the plan that God has for your life. Of course, it originates, of course, with God. If it's our plan, it may not be His. So if it's our plan and we use our life to work that out, it may not work out that well. But how many know if we, got, if we're, if we had, knows God's will for our life and we get His plan for our life and we're working towards going in that direction, then that's something God's behind. That's something he's working towards. That's, that's something he's already worked out every detail of your life and of your plan and of the vision that he has for you. And I like to call, if I could use it this way, this analogy, I like to call the dream a seed. The word's called a seed, and God is the word. Jesus is the word of God. And so what he gives us is he doesn't give us the whole thing. He doesn't give us the end result. He gives us the seed. And if you ever went in, um, if you're ever going to plant a garden, you know, you just don't go in and, and pl- you know, plant the watermelon. You plant watermelon seeds, right? Well, of course. And so that's the, way, that's, the, that's the way it is with everything God does in the Word. It starts off with a seed. And so we know from Luke chapter 8, I think it's verse 11, it says the Word of God is the seed, or the seed is God's Word. And so a dream, we'll just say it this way, a dream is a seed from God. And uh, for it to materialize and produce fruit, then it has to go through a process of development. It has actually many stages to it. And the first stage, of course, would be conception, uh, when God places that vision or that dream, and he places it in your heart. And uh, we could belabor many of these points, but we'll just kind of go for the, through the, uh, the stages of it. 
So first one would be conception. That's where, once again, God says, I've called you to this. This is, uh, this is why you're, uh, that's the number one, almost the number one thing people want to know as they, as they get past their, their, their youth and their teenage years. And they, sometimes they, they, uh, they go out there and they're, I don't know, I don't know about y'all, but kind of like when I was in my teenage years, I pretty well thought I was going to conquer the world by the time I was 25. And then by 25, it had beat me up so badly I had to sit down for a while. <laughs> but anyway, so here we, we're seeing that the plan that God gives us is exact, absolutely the perfect will of God for your life. And when you come to know that the, His will for your life, it'll be, something, it'll be something peaceful in your heart. It may not be something that you ever thought you'd, you'd be interested in doing. It may not be something that you'd always thought as a as a child or a teenager or even went to school for or college for. A lot of people go to college and they don't even know for sure, you know, what they're, you know, what they're, when they do their four years or, their, or how many times, a lot of times, you know, they're, t they're taking classes, kind of figuring out as they go. They may have an idea, a general idea, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, some of y'all look like you're over 30 in this room and uh, <clears throat> some of us may still not figure out what we want to do with our life. <laughs> I, I'm still trying to decide what I'm going to do when I grow up. That's a joke, by the way. But anyway, so conception would be the first stage. And then number two is the development of that seed. It's the time when the seed is growing all the way up into the birth of the dream, just, just like you would for a garden or flowers, whatever it is. Or, of course, you, you could think about a couple having a child. Well, I say a couple, actually. It's more like the, the mother that has the, the female. The, the, I don't think the husband ever had it, but the seed comes from him, right? But that child grows in the mother's womb for, for nine months. Well, that is the, that's the conception, but then there has to be the development of that. And so a pregnant mother, generally uh, pretty much nine months, take a, take a few um, days or weeks or, or give a few, but nine months is the time. And that's a very critical time, very critical time that that, uh, that child, uh, for instance, uh, in the mother's womb, it has that time to develop and has that time to grow. And it's very critical that your, that your dream, the plan that God has for your life, that it has the time to, uh, to grow and to increase and to become all that needs to be because, once again, there's many stages to the dream and the plan, and so it has to go through all these developments. And um, so that's when the enemy tries to come into your life. And I say the enemy, I'm talking about nobody other than Satan, devil, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him. Someone called him Beelzebub. Well, <laughs> Beelzebub, well, he has many names. And, uh, but that's when the enemy, Jesus said, you know, I come to bless you, but he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So that's when the thief comes. And sometimes you say, well, what does he steal? Well, he steals a lot of things. But he is a, he is a dream stealer because he's after life, and he's after everything that has to do with your life. See, really, really even Christians are no threat to him whatsoever. It, it, he doesn't even care that you're going to go to heaven. The devil doesn't care that you're going to go to heaven. The, the, the devil doesn't care that we're having church. The devil doesn't care that we, that we get together and we, we read the Bible or we pray together. What bothers him is when you actually are, um, find the significance of your life and you're, on, you're in the plan of your life, whatever it is. It's not because you preach the gospel like I do. It's because you're doing what you're called to do. When, when you're calling what you're called to do, you're on the God plan, and therefore you are, have become a huge threat to the kingdom of God. And that's the reason why you have some trouble sometimes. Everybody ever had any trouble in their life a little bit just along the way? You felt like you had, a, a, I don't know, maybe strained two or three days together over there. I mean, that long, you know, had, had that much trouble. Just two or three days, imagine that. And so, um, uh, no, it's, it, this, is, this is where the dream stealer comes in. And that's where he comes to steal, he comes to kill, and comes to destroy. And that's where people, the, they, lose, they lose heart. That's where they become what the Bible calls weary and well-doing or they become faint-hearted is because they had, a, they, had, they had the dream, they had the vision, they, they, they feel in the heart, they know what it is from God and they move in a direction, but the enemy comes immediately. That's what Mark chapter 4 says. When the word's sown into our heart, the Satan doesn't come in two weeks. He didn't get there next month. He comes immediately to steal that seed. Now remember we call the dream or the vision, we're calling that the seed in your heart. So he's coming, he's coming for it immediately. Um, we, we pulled up some, some, um, some bushes in the, in the yard this week, and, and they're a few years old, but they've had time, you know, to, to get some roots to it. And it wasn't, and it was uh, during the last storm we had, they wasn't destroyed, but they were, 
they were leaning over like this, and there wasn't there was no way to get them back up again. So it was just time to jerk them up. And uh, it, um, well, the golf cart wasn't going to do it, and the zero turn wasn't going to do it, but the truck will. <laughs> because it had time to grow and it had time for a root system. And so Satan doesn't really want you to have a root system. He doesn't wait and visit you until you have deep roots. He likes to catch you on the shallow part. And really, I could just take all this mark forward and just, just, just narrow it down to there out there, but that's really when he comes in. He's coming before you have time to get roots in. The, because Mark 4 says, like, he says, you know, he gave us four people, he gave us four uh, type one seed, and Mark 4 said the sower sows the seed, but we see four different people he speaks of in that parable. And one of them, he says, when they hear the word, they get excited initially. Man, they get excited, they get fired up, and they're moving that direction. It says, but <laughs> they get excited, but all of a sudden, things come into their life that they weren't expecting, things that they don't want, seed they don't want in their life. And so when, I, when the opposition comes, it's an opposition for you to release that dream, for you to release that seed, for you to say, because you've been saying, in the name of Jesus, I believe uh, I'm debt free in Jesus' name. I believe that I'm healed. I, or wh whatever it is that you're believing in the promise of God, that's what you're believing. And that's your, that's your hope. That's your promise. That is the seed of the Word of God. But remember, Satan, John 10.10, 10, is the thief. He's coming to steal that. So he's coming to steal the seed that you've sown. No one can but him because it's in your heart. You know, so the only, one who can, the only way he can get in your heart to sow it is that you have, you have to be the one to open the door. Well, we, we shouldn't open the door to the thief, not ourselves. So we're, we're actually the one tilling the garden. We're actually the one protecting the garden. So it's us that opens the door and lets, it, and let him, ha lets him have access to it. But it's not that he comes to us and says, hey, I'm here to steal the seed. You know, give me the keys to the door. No. No, it, it comes in all shapes and all sizes. It comes through different voices and people and personality, people that's, that's very close to you. People sometimes, they even have your last name. I mean, imagine that. And they come, and, and it's not that they do it, you know, on purpose. Um, sometimes they're not even aware that they're doing it. You know, and it comes in all shapes and sizes, offense, and so many different ways. But Satan is after that seed because he cannot allow the harvest of your life to be harvested. Because your harvest of the seed of God means his demise. So he's after your seed. He's after your joy. He's after your peace. And so we're not going to let him do it. And I said, and you can say amen about that. We're not going to let him have the seed. Amen. amen. So this is, this is what he tries to do. So we need to remind ourselves of this every day that once God has planted that dream or vision in our heart, he has every intention of it bringing it to pass. This is not a maybe, hope so, we'll, we'll check it out and see what might happen. No, he has every intention. So we don't ever want to let go of the seed. You don't want to let go of the dream. You don't want to let go. You can have things that can enforce it. Maybe it's a picture. Maybe you can write a scripture out. Maybe you can put it in a visual form, something that you're doing. If you, if, if you have a company, or you, have a, or you have an idea for going and business yourself, maybe there's some way you can put that on paper in picture form and you can keep it in front of you. That is biblical. He said, write the vision down, make it plain. Well, if you can't, if, if you can't make it plain to someone else, it's because you can't make it plain to you. So you have to be able to see it first before you can, uh, before you can uh, if you have others that's going to be involved with you, uh, then they're going to have to be able to see it and they're going to have to know what the dream is too soon. They've got to be able to conceptualize it and be able to see it on the inside so that when we talk about it, they'll say, oh, I see what you're talking about. Then we can believe together. Then we can make plans together. And so we don't want to let go of the dream. Habakkuk chapter 2, we won't turn there, but Habakkuk chapter 2 says, And then God answered and said, Write this, write what you see, write it out on big block letters so that it can be read on the run. It can be read on the run. Hmm? That's what people do in advertising. Uh, we were talking about a while ago about being on the interstate, and when you're looking at signboards for advertising, or or just just on a just on a, a regular highway, uh, where they have advertising, advertisers know, or just having a, a church sign. Everyone knows that you have three to ten seconds, but more like three to five seconds for us for you, them to see that sign. Uh, unless you're on the interstate, and it's a huge sign. Maybe you have, maybe you can see it. You'll have 30 seconds or more to see that. But most most 
businesses have about a three to seven second window to be able to see what you're trying to say, like Burger King's over here or, or Sally's Shoe Store, da da da, da is over here. Well, that's what, this, that's what the vision message and board is for, is it to enforce it within you and so that you, you can keep it in front of you so that you don't lose the vision, that you don't lose the hope. Because you can get so busy in the details of it and in life that you actually let go of the process because you lost your focus, which we'll talk about that more in a minute. And so he went on to say in the back of chapter 2, he says, uh, he says, if it seems slow in coming, wait on it. He didn't say abandon it. He said, wait on it. If what you're believing for and what God has spoken to you about, he's put in your heart, if it's slow in coming, he says, wait on it. It's on the way. This is the Bible I'm reading. If it's slow in coming, wait on it. It's on the way. It will come. It will come right. I don't know what's, uh, I wished I uh, had put the translation. I don't know if this is the uh, message, but it says it will come right on time. God's not late. He's right on time. Number three you need to know is you don't, don't ever abort the dream. Do not abort the dream. Don't. Because there's going to be a lot of naysayers in your life who's going to tell you you can't do it. And if, you, and if it could be done, you couldn't do it. And who do you are thinking God would use you to do something like that? I'm just talking about in my world. I mean, I, I, I've met a lot of well-meaning people whose who's God has called some of their family members to do certain things. And then the family members, you know, I mean, I, I know they didn't mean to hurt them, but actually did hurt them. And said, so, baby, you I can't imagine that you even believe that God's going to do that with you. Well, you're not called to do that. Well, <clears throat> Jesus had half-brothers. You know, he went to his own hometown, and some said, that some believe he's the Messiah. They said, Messiah? That's Joseph's son. They, they built our kitchen table just you know, last fall and, uh, <clears throat> and put an extra room on the house. They know, it's not Messiah. Well, God, God somehow believes he could put Jesus here as a carpenter, and that will be a, a good craft right into Messiahship, if that's a word. <laughs> so you, you, can't, you can't base it on anything that you're seeing or what life's look like or what it has been. Why? Because he says it's a seed. It's going to grow. How many of the seed always looks different than the harvest? No one plants a seed wanting a harvest of seeds. Do you? No. When, when you bake a cake, I'm sorry, Barbara, if I messed this up, but I mean, I mean, I, I just, I can bake a cake, but I'm talking about just Duncan Hines, Betty Crocker, and you, you know, get you a little thing and you open the thing, pour it in there right, and then you pour so much oil if you're doing that, or you use margarine, say, I know what I'm talking about, I know what I'm talking about, and then you put either one to two eggs, right, whatever, and you got to put so much water and, and like that, and then you got, and you're either going to have to, Get you a mixer, electric, or you have to do electric call here. They have to whoop it, which is called whip it. But since we're in Alabama, you can whoop it if you're in Alabama. But you, if you're <coughs> watching me from, you know, Michigan or somewhere, you need to whip it. Here we just whoop it. I anyway, then move on past that. So, and, and then you mix it together. Then you put it in there for, you know, 30, 25, 35 minutes, depending on how much you make it, and put it on. We you know what other temperature, 350, 375, somewhere in there. And, you, and then you have to let it sit for a while, get it out. If you want to know if it's ready, I'm just, now I'm just really messing with you. Pull it out a little bit, you can put a little toothpick into it. I'm just preaching mostly to women, not so I'm wasting my time. And so the, pooth, the, the, pooth tick in the, to, in the toothpick, <laughs> the, the pooth tick will tell you whether or not it's ready, right? You can pull, that's one way of knowing, right? Well, you say, why did you say all that? Well, you put in eggs and sugar and oil or you know what whatever that you use right and you didn't want a harvest of that did you I don't want a harvest of oil, of oil and eggs to eat you know raw eggs and sugar just like that no I mean I want to mix all that together so come it out and then you know put your icing on it so the seed is just the ingredient that goes into the room or goes into the ground and then that ground over a period of time it takes in that seed dies and germinates doesn't it and God told a seed from the very beginning. He says, when a seed goes in the ground, he's already told the ground, you produce and you multiply whatever is sowed into this ground. 
Isn't it funny that the dirt knows what to do with the seed, and the seed knows what to do in the dirt? It doesn't need any. It doesn't need any information from you and I what to do about it. That God already had a talk with seed and dirt before before we ever came along. How do, how does the seed and the dirt get together and and turn into you know a multiplied harvest? It's just amazing. We don't think anything about it, but it's pretty amazing. If you don't think that's amazing, then go put you a hairbrush and you bury, bury it in the ground tonight and you let me know what happens in about three months. <laughs> you may tell you what's going to happen. Your hairbrush is gone and it's dirty. <laughs> it's gone, but you're not going to get a stalk or a bush or whatever. It's going to have, you know, all the stuff on it. It's just, just not going to happen. Because if that could happen, anything could happen. If that would happen, I would plant ice cream. I'd plant one bucket of ice cream, and then I have, you know, I just, you know, come out here and have all these buckets out here. I mean, I wouldn't even care if they were the little ones, you know. It doesn't hurt to dream. I'm talking about dreams. <laughs> so we don't want to abort the dream, and uh, so we need we need to be patient and give it time. And I shouldn't have to say this, but sometimes it it helps to say it because I've had to remind myself: don't give up. Never give up. Y'all say that with me. Never give up. Never Tell give someone up. else, say, never give up. Never give up. Come say, I better not catch you giving up. Giving up. I'll put a whooping on you. <laughs> yeah. First Thessalonians 5.24, you can listen to this. As faithful as he that called you, who also will do it. He called it, I'll do it. If he didn't call it, then we may not can hold on to that word. But he said, he said he's faithful. Whether well, anybody else is not, he said, I'm faithful. And he that has called you, he's, he's actually going to do what he, hit. God's actually going to do what he said he's going to do. Amen. That was what we talked about Sunday, about confidence. And then uh, we won't, um, well, I'm not, for sake of time, we won't go on that part. And, uh, and these dreams are not miracles determined by fate or chance. That, that's not what they are. They're, they're, uh, they're not uncontrollable. They're not unpredictable. It's not a roll of the dice and let's see what happens. No, they're very, um, they're very precise. In other words, God wants you to know. You may not know the exact how it's going to come or the when it's going to come about a vision or a dream coming together. But he says, once you get that vision in your heart and you have faith for the vision and you can see it with your in your heart, he said, it's... It's, it's just like the blade in Mark chapter 4. The seed goes in first, then what do we see after that? We don't wake up the next day and it, or the, a few days. After a while, if it's corn, you'll get a whole stalk. But you don't go from a seed and you, you see nothing, and then the next day you get up and you have a whole stalk. No, you first you get a little blade. That's Mark chapter 4. It says first the blade, right? Seed, then the blade, then the corn, then the whole, or the stalk, then the whole uh, corn in the ear. So... You can see the progression of harvest. You can see the progression of a, a, of a dream. But remember, it always comes in seed form. So don't become frustrated. Or don't become uh, overly concerned. And don't you know, give up just because, well, by now, surely this should have come to pass. Really? Well, just think about it. From if, you, if you raise children, you said, surely by now they should be able to make their bed. Surely by now they should be able to you know, to do this or do that. Well, er, er, and, and to every child's different. I mean, you got some people, some kids that walk real early, and you got some who, who, who just like, to, they like to be picked up. Some, some kids are born at the hospital, and they, they weigh them, and they set them down, they start off walking, they go to the vending machine. <laughs> well, not, well, probably a little time in there, but I'm talking about, you know. So you can't go by, you know, l little Sally walked at eight months, and Johnny's over here, he's, he's two and a half years old. You, you can't go by that. One good thing about it is, if they're not walking, you know exactly where they are. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one day when they're older and you get keys to the car, you may wonder where they are. So, so you, have, you have to go, you have to look at the good part. So these dreams, they're, they're not miracles, you know, determined by maybe a fate or chance. And, uh, no, they're very predictable. And so God has given you the option to succeed and God said, I can participate in the progress of my own miracle, my own life. Why? Because he gave me the decision to make choices. We can choose. The Bible says you can choose life or you can choose death, and I choose life. Now, I want to just, 
Um, I want to give you just a little bit tonight because I think this is one of the main components. We've got about 15 minutes, but this is one of the main components of making sure that you have harvest so that after you plant the seed, after you know the will of God for your life, and after you're moving in, in, that, in that direction, that this is not the place where, where it's aborted, where the dream is aborted. And so we, we, we've talked about this before, and it's about focus. And, um, and you could, there, there's three or four of these that I've, I've came up with one myself, uh, an acronym for focus uh, uh, one time, and, and, uh, and I called it this, uh, follow our course until successful. Follow our course until successful would be an acronym. It could be for, for focus itself. And so there's, there's, um, there's some good news, and then there's some bad news. Which one do y'all want first? Who, who wants the bad news first? Who wants the good news first? I think the good one out. Okay. The bad news is... <laughs> I was messing with y'all. The, okay, I'm sorry. The good news is, whatever you focus on will expand. Is that good? Now, you ready for the bad news? Whatever you focus on will expand. <laughs> now, make sure you write that down just right now. <laughs> whatever you focus on, the good news is, whatever you focus on, is, it's going to expand. So, the bad news is, whatever you focus on is going to expand. That wouldn't be too hard to get. So, when you think about focus, you could use a lot of um, examples, but you know, a lot of times we talk about the eagle and, and how God made the eagle, which is a, a glorious bird. And um, it says when they're hunting, you know, they're, of course, they're hunting for their breakfast or whatever it is. They're, they're hunting for their prey in the air. And um, it says that the, that the eagle can focus at pinpoint accuracy up to five kilometers or three miles. So he can be up hundreds of feet in the air. And he, and he can see with pinpoint accuracy five miles. Did y'all did y'all hear me? <laughs> no, pinpoint accuracy from five miles, and that's they're talking about something like a field mouse. No, he, he's not running down a hippopotamus. Well, we we could all see something like that far off, but for just a little field mouse, he can see from five miles away, hundreds of hundreds of feet up in the air. It said that no matter the obstacle, the eagle will not move his focus away from his prey until he seizes it. And uh, you might say, well, I think, you know, that's a good thing to have, but maybe I think talent or potential is more important than it. Well, they are important, you know, to have talent and to have potential, but they won't do you any good without focus. Can you see that? These are all several components. But, you know, we'll talk about some of these as we go on. Persistence and all types. All those things are, are, are all the things necessary, uh, uh, the ingredients, you know, to, to run the race. But focus is going to be one of the main, main events because I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But I think the number one reason why we don't see the vision come to pass as quick as we could or see it even come to pass, some people don't is because of something called, I, don't, I like to call it broken focus. And that's where Satan, ma he, he's masterful at breaking your focus. He, he, can't, he can't make you abort the dream, it's still our choice, but he sure can distort matters in your life to where you're looking at other things. And, uh, and so we've we got to make sure that we're, we're keeping our eye on the ball, as it were, so to speak. And so it is important, you know, to have talent and potential, but it's like this... Um, I read this thing about a guy who said, um, he said, uh, of course, uh, potential is important, if, and, uh, but he said, but it will do you no good without focus. He said, it's like being, an, he said, it's like being an octopus on roller skates. Can you get a picture of what that would look like? <laughs> he says, yeah, so an octopus on roller skates, he said, you can be sure there's going to be plenty of movement, but you don't know in what direction it's going to be, but there's going to be a lot of movement. If you're an octopus on, on uh, roller skates, you're going to have a lot of direction. And so three things here that uh, 
we'll call them categories, and this will help you how, by how you see yourself. In other, in other words, to be able to stay focused on the, on the vision, on the plan, so you'll know where you're headed. Number, uh, number th three ways to see yourself. Number one is uh, the way others see you. Uh, we care about that, but this it's the least important. Of the three, it's the least important. The way others see you. Number two, how do I see myself? That is, that is very, very important. But let me qualify that when I say, how do I see myself? The question is, where are you getting your information at? How do you see yourself, and where are you getting your information for that? Because if you have a, you could have a very poor self-image, but you can't get it out of here. Hmm? You, you, you could think, I, I can never do it, but, but you can't get that out of here. There's, with, with, with God, it's I can do, not, not I can't do. With God, I can do. And you got to get to where you can believe that yourself. You know, it's very important, all these things are important to have, to have, um, I, I, I could just say this in ministry, I mean, but, but I've been in business also for many years myself and, and uh, ran a business and, and, and employed people. And it's great to have people who are very talented. Uh, in some professions, it's, it's really important, right? I mean, I, I don't want to go to the dentist with a guy, you know, who just, you know, he, he has a lot of charisma, but, you know, he's, he's just not that accurate with the drill. Or a shot. I'm not. I'm just not. <laughs> just, just, just not that interested. You know, the brain surgeon. You know, he's got a little. He's got a little shake going on. I don't, I'm not really interested. In, you know. But other than those kind of situations, I have found out through my experience, and y'all may disagree with me, but but I would rather if I had to hire someone who had maybe a a, a, a B ability that we could build on, or even a C ability. Who had a great attitude? Then I would rather have an A student who had an attitude that 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 stinks. I've been, I've worked with both. I've worked around both, and I've hired both. And there's nothing worse than having someone who has the giftedness and, and the ability to do something, but they have they have a very poor attitude, and they work around other people because th that attitude will spread ten times faster than someone with a great attitude. Bad news shouldn't spread that fast, but it seems like in the world it does. And so it's going to be very important, you know, that you have the right attitude about this. So, uh, how, number one, we said, how do, how do others see me? That's important, but it's not, it's not as important. Number two, how do I see myself? And I said the question to qualify that is where you're getting your information. Number three is, of course, how, how does God see me? Well, that's, that's the most important. How, how does God see me? How does God see me? And when you, when, when you see and you find out in the Word your worth and your value and how God sees you, when I found out, I know you say, boy, you're a slow learner. When I found out how much God loved me years ago, man, I was impressed with how much He loved you. When I saw how much I was loved, then I could look at you and I could see your value and worth much more than I ever saw it before. Because, see, I knew all about me, and you didn't tell me all your mistakes. And I don't, I don't want to know them tonight either. Please don't line up and line up. I don't, there's just some things I don't need to know and some things you don't need to tell anybody. Don't even tell yourself some things. <laughs> That's what Paul said. I'm forgetting the things that are behind me. If he forgot them, I won't be telling you about them either. So, because he forgot them. So, how, how do you see our, uh, yourself, but then more importantly, how does God see you, see you only valuable? Why? For God so loved that he gave his 79 Buick. Hmm. His rock collection. No. God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. So we, we know you're worth by that. We know to him you're irreplaceable. And, uh, because, and, and if you want to look at it like this, God invested himself in you. See, God really believes the dream that he has for you is possible, and here's why. Jesus didn't die for your sins. He did not do that. Some of, some of us have been told that Jesus came and he died for our sins. 
He did not die for your sins. He died, at, he, he died as your sin. God took on the nature of man, which means he took on sin. He died as your sin, not for your sin. And if you don't know the difference, we need to spend a whole series on that. When you think about what I just said, it's, it's much more than God looking down and saying, I love you and I have pity for you, I have compassion on you, and I'm going to die in your place for your sin. But in order for you to become righteous and holy before him, he had to become guilty of what you were guilty of, and then you would be free. You would have the freedom that he had and the righteousness that he had before, and then he would trade places with you. So he didn't die for your sin. He died as your sin. Now do you know who you are now? Does that give you a little glimpse in, into how valuable that you are? So we don't want to be just confident. We talked about being confident Sunday. We want to be, if I can use this word, we want to be Godfident. We want to be God conscious. Not just confident, but, but Godfident. Making a decision to get focused. And uh, so I said this one uh, while ago, and this is my opinion, number one reason why most people fail is just because of broken focus. And, um, and that's how the enemy tries to make people fail over and over and over again is by simply breaking their focus. And uh, when, we're, when we're focused on something, it brings clarity. What, the more you can focus on a plan or just a, a goal. When, you, when you're focused on a goal, it might, m maybe, maybe to lose so much weight, you know, whatever, whatever that is, and you have a plan, and you stay focused on it, and you got a vision for it. You know, it, it's one thing to have a plan, or it's one, it's one thing to have a goal, but do you have a plan? See, I've had, <coughs> th through the years in losing weight, I have lost 500 pounds, somewhere around 500 pounds. Lose 30, gain it back, lose, you know, 20, gain, gain 25 back. If you add up all the weights that I lost, I, I probably have lost four or 500 pounds. Well, it's easy to have a, 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 a strategy or easy to have a, a goal, but if you don't have a strategy, you don't have a plan, your focus is going to get way off. And all you got to do is just go you buy a certain whatever pulls you that way. You know, there's certain foods that have sins. If you're walking in the mall, whatever, you go down here to the Galleria and they're cooking up this over here, or you, the cookie company, if it's still up there on the second floor and they're baking, you know, homemade cookies, you know, it, that's got a scent to it. If you go somewhere in there and they're making, you ever been into the mall where they got those Cinnabons, homemade cinnamon, cinnamon buns about this big? That has an aroma to it. And it seemed like, you know, it was always on the top right if you was, you know, going from north to south. And I, I always started moving somehow in that direction. I mean, I wasn't going upstairs, but something was whatever. And it wasn't Payless Shoes doing it. <laughs> it was them, cinna, it was them Cinnabons. <laughs> how many know the homemade pretzels has a, has a smell to it? Uh, how many know pizza has a smell to it? How you know fish has a smell to it? Mm -hmm. Michelle says, yes, why I don't eat it at all, but anyway. <laughs> well, that's how enemy comes, you know, to break your focus. He, he puts something in the path to, to divert your attention. Something, someone, some situation. You know, he's, he, he's like an arsonist. You know, he'll go set a fire, <laughs> fire over here, and you'll run over there and go put that out, because, so that way you're not manning your station. And when you get over and you get that put out, you'll say, you look up, there'll be another fire over there. And it's usually, you know, you got to go deal with this and that and this situation, and then they're calling on you, and they're calling on you, and you're trying, to, you're trying to stay focused on what you're doing, but he's trying to divert your attention. So focus brings clarity. And so we got to make sure that if, we're, if, we know the if we know the plan and we have the strategy, then we'll stay focused, and that'll bring clarity. And when you have clarity, then these other things come up that you can choose yes or no. You'll, you'll know what to say. You'll, you will know, K-N-O-W, what to say no to. Because if you say yes to everything and everybody, you'll never accomplish your goal. You're not called to help everybody. We're, we're called to people, but we're not called... You, I, you say, well, I'm an evangelist, you know, to get the law saved. Yeah, but you're not called to save everybody in the whole world. Not you by yourself, are you? 
Aren't you glad that God didn't, is not making you responsible for getting the whole world saved? I am, Lord, I, if no one else is, I'm, I'm excited that I'm not supposed to get everyone saved in the whole world. So God never told you to be busy. We need to get that out of our vocabulary. How you been? Man, I've been busy. No, we don't want to be busy. We want, we want to be fruitful. And there's a big difference between both of them. Uh, we'll, uh, we're about to run out of time, or we did run out of time. And um, it's, you know, it's almost like, and I've said this before, when I started driving a motorcycle, I'd, I'd had one in my early 20s, but it'd been when I got my next one, it, I'd, it'd been a few years. Married, had a few kids, it'd been a long time. So you just don't jump on one if you haven't been on one in a while. You say, well, it's just like a bike, you know, if you've ever done it. <laughs> yeah, well, this was a bigger bike. So uh, a few years ago, um, I bought a bike, and it was, a, it was a, well, the, it was 1,800 cc's, which, you know, which will go roll at 140 miles an hour. But that bike was almost 900 pounds. And not, not having been on a motorcycle for over 10 years, I mean, I, I think I bought it up in you know, Pelham, didn't I? Yeah. I bought it up in Pelham, and I bought it at rush hour. And if you haven't been on a bike in 10 years, and it's 900 pounds, and you're, and you're looking down for the gears, and, and you're looking down where the foot pedal is, and all that kind of, and you know, you got brakes on up here, and you got brakes down there, and you wanna, you know, and every bike has its own feel to it. And I'm looking down, you know, where the gear shift is, and it's just been a minute. And the guy says, well, well, I think, buddy, we got you all your stuff ready. What he said, anything you matter? I says, no, everything's fine. He says, oh, okay, well, I just know she's been sitting out here, and I says, he says, you sure nothing's wrong? And I said, no, sir, I'm just thinking about going home. <laughs> he said, well, anything wrong with the bike? I said, no, ain't nothing wrong with the bike because it's the driver I'm worried about. <laughs> I, I haven't driven one in 10 years, and I, I know how to do it. And I took the service road back and forth. But, you know, service road, you know, 10 miles an hour is not, is not you know, Pelham getting on there and busy. And uh, so... There's a couple times I, I put on the brake and I put on too heavy and it leaned real fast and I, and I was trying to get 865 pounds of, uh, and that wouldn't be too good on me today. But anyway, it wasn't too good then. So it took it took me a little while, but you know after I got used to it, then I could you know I could drive and shave and eat and you know and look to turn around and do the baton and all kind of stuff after. No, I just kidding. But anyway, just but at that time, <laughs> you know, you know, and when I drove a motorcycle, you know, the thing to tell you is. When you drive a motorcycle, you always keep your eye on where you're going or, or where you want to go and not where you are. I mean, if you, if you start looking at a raccoon over here, that's where you're headed. <laughs> that's just the way it works. If, if you're looking over here at the sign like, you know, so-and-so, we got ribs, well, you, you're going to break your ribs <laughs> against that pine tree in just a minute. NASCAR drivers, and we'll close here, NASCAR drivers will tell you that if... Um, if they get into a spin, you know, they're trained. When you get in a spin, the worst thing you can ever do is your goal is to be n not to hit the wall, but your strategy is, n is to look at the wall, not trying to hit it. If, you, if, you, if you're in a spin and you're, t and you're trying not to hit the wall, do not put your eyes on the wall. Put your eyes in where the car needs to go because if you look at the wall, that's exactly where you're headed. Never look at the wall. So that's why sometimes when I get in trouble with my wife, I don't ever look at her. And I just, no, I'm, just I'm just, that's a bad joke. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to get in trouble over there. I better just look over here. <laughs> well, I've been married, what, Monday? We've been married, what, 30, 30, 38 years. So I know sign language. I didn't used to know it, but I know it now. I mean, I, I know the verbal and the nonverbal. So sometimes it's better that I just focus over here somewhere. Can I go home with someone? I, I might need somewhere to stay tonight. So, we're going to finish our course. How many of you got a course? And we're going to finish it. Because if you're not going to finish it, you might as well just go home now. Right? How many want to go to heaven when you leave? How many want to leave tonight? <laughs> See? <laughs> I'm not talking about the rapture. I'm talking about, you know, you have to leave the other way. Quit that breathing thing. Well, you say, well, yeah, when I, when I die, I want to go, but... But uh, Jesus is coming. How'd Brother Hagin you say that? And he said, Oh, I thought you was getting a 
I thought you were getting up a load to go tonight. No, I don't want to. I don't want. Yeah, I do want to go to heaven, but not not tonight. Not now that Jesus ain't coming. So we're gonna stay on the path. We're gonna stay focused. Now you do know between now and Sunday, since I preach this, someone's gonna come along to you. Something's gonna come on TV. Whatever it is, something's gonna happen. It can be your dog. It can be whatever. Dogs have bad moments, don't they? Yours had one another night. It's like, it's like, man, she choking. Is she gonna make it? I mean, what did she? Did she swallow the dog? Our neighbor's dog? Or I mean, it's like, oh, oh, oh. I'm just saying something. Something's gonna. Something's gonna happen in your life to break to break your focus. And and the more that we can master that, the better that we can do. I'm telling you, the faster you're gonna move, and you're gonna get. You're gonna go to. The, you're gonna hit the prize. You're gonna go all the way to the mark. You're going to get to the mile marker, and you're going to get to the place to where God always intended for you. And then when you get there, God's going to start you all over again on something else. <laughs> but it's going to be fun all the way through. Amen? Well, we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen.